I want to start with a comment. There are two things that I think have been uh, missed in a lot of the discussion. One of them is that the prior literature on left main stenting is comprised primarily of last-ditch patients. They were rejects from every therapy. Uh, and that's a big part of why syntax is so important, because it's a modern uh, trial of a defined group of patients, and these are the patients we're interested in. So there are absolutely, I mean, every prior study that we have all used to support our various arguments, and everybody at the table, we all do it, we pick our studies. Uh, but that's why syntax, one of the reasons syntax is so important. The other thing that um, nobody showed is what was the PCI like in syntax? Uh, the mean number of stents was 4.6. The mean stent of length was 86 millimeters. One third of the patients had more than 100 millimeters of stenting. And uh, I think I can speak for the entire interventional community, save maybe Antonio Colombo and Paul Tierstein, that not too many of us do that every day. And that this represented uh, the farthest extreme of stenting. Uh, and that as we get further subset analysis and we compare, and we, we didn't talk about the syntax score, but we have a gradation of the degree of coronary disease by the syntax score, which is basically an angiographic disease burden sort of complexity score, I think we'll be able to zero in even further on which patients really can have good long-term outcomes with PCI. So uh, just a couple of... I, I hope comments that are uh, actually unifying rather than uh, I, I think, uh, um, Ted, your comment about uh, the early literature on uh, left main stenting is actually very valid because a lot of those studies actually find it into, this, uh, in, into some of the uh, review articles that are actually published. In fact, the Ultima registry clearly demonstrated that when you have good patients, uh, even the Ultima registry, which had one of the worst mortalities, with left main stenting actually demonstrated that when you have low risk uh, patients, patients with good EF, uh, patients where the left main was not calcified with normal renal function, the uh, one year mortality was actually very, very low and very acceptable. So I think uh, the baseline risk, uh, risk status is actually uh, critical. If, if, if I could pick you up on two things you said. You said that most of those patients in registry were last stitch. That's not the case at all. If you look at the definition for patients in the registry, often what it says is it was at the choice of the patient and the physician. So they weren't all last stitch patients. The second thing is, is the patients who may do well with left main are those with the osteal or mid shaft lesions. But that's a very different beast from the distal lesion, particularly in the association of three vessel coronary disease. So, so will you give us that much at least? I mean, because I see a lot of patients. We saw Raj presented one that yeah. the attorney got a stroke and he had a very simple lesion that has terrific outcomes. And I, I, I think. Can you give I, us that? Can we just have those patients? <laughs> yeah. as, as long as you follow them up carefully. But there's something I'd like to pick, uh, there's something I really think I need to pick both Paul and Raj up on, and it's their misunderstanding of the nature of this disease. They both seem to adopt a policy that you can take an initial strategy of PCI and keep stenting them whenever, and it has no adverse effect. But the point of all the survival data is that within three years, 5% of those patients would be dead. So just delaying and temporizing, saying that we can keep repeatedly stenting the patients without jeopardizing their long-term outcome is, ad is completely wrong. Because as I say, 5% of those patients will be dead within three years who, if they had cabbage, would still be alive. I don't know how you can say it. Well, because that's what the data shows. Due to repeat, due to repeat uh, PCI? I mean, you're saying that they're that they're dying because we have to we do repeat PCI. No, they die before they get the repeat PCI. The point is that by not by I, I would agree that you need to do careful follow up. We do we do angiographic follow up on, um, on unprotected left main standing. So uh, we don't do as careful follow up on the surgical patients because I guess you accept the later mortality in that group. Well no the good cardiologist should still be following them up as well. For the angiograms. I, I doubt you could afford it. Yeah. The two points I, I would like to make, well, I have a plethora, but I will only focus in two. It's uh, <laughs> got a long list here. Forget lunch. Uh, uh, one is about stroke rate. I, I think 
we will be in violation of the intention to treat principle if we interpret the strobe data in syntax any other way than the way it was presented. So I, I'll grant you that. I think but, why? Because, because the patients, when they get bypass surgery, end up waiting right. in the hospital. And that's in, in the but, but I, I can't but, exclude it. Right, but there's another important point. What is the procedural stroke rate? And there was a meta-analysis published by Bravada last uh, year in Annals that looked at 23 trials. And the, uh, the procedural stroke rate with bypass surgery was 1.2%. 1 at 30 days, which is what the procedural uh, is defined. And if you extrapolate from syntax data, which I'm loath not to, to uh, then half of the strokes occurred before the patient got bypass surgery. So Raj's comment about stroke rate being 2% um, is not really borne out by the evidence. It's close to about 1% procedural stroke rate, and I'm pretty sure... Uh, 1.2. 1. 1. Oh, right, so right. It's actually only twice PCI instead of... No, 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 but that's, no, that's one clarification that I wanted to make. The second point I want to make, which I think has been misinterpreted, is the crossover rate in courage. In courage, the crossover rate in the medical therapy arm was 32% at the end of follow-up. The median duration was about 11 months. So the way to interpret this is that half of the uh, uh, crossovers occurred by the first year, presumably due to some progression. Okay. Right. Now with, with, with uh, the PCI arm, the repeat revascularization rate was 22% at the end of follow-up, and at median duration was about 10, 11 months, which means 11% of the patients that got PCI to begin with had restenosis and therefore had repeat intervention. The other 16% in the medical therapy, the other 11% in the PCI were due to progression of disease and the non-culprit lesion. So the, your comment by saying 21% crossover in the first three months is not accurate. The 21% crossover was at the end of follow-up in the number of patients for which the quality of life data was collected. Not 32% in the all cohorts, uh, all data set. 21% at the end of follow-up. Perhaps they should have included that in the editorial so they could explain it, but as long as you're on the subject of crossover, you made that very, very strong point that medical therapy works so great because over time, by three years, the answer is about the same in PCI versus medical therapy group. But that's because all these patients crossed over to PCI. No. So you're right, yeah, the initial strategy works fine, and, but you know, you're going to have these patients that are going to end up with PCI anyway. What the they point I'm trying to make statistically is that the only time point mm -hmm. which will differentiate a treatment difference between the two is at year one. And the way I interpret it is that you start off with patients with, with medical therapy, 16% of them will get an intervention. You start off in another patient at time zero that 100% got PCI, and then 11% of them will get PCI at one year. So you're doing a comparison of 16% PCI versus 111% PCI, and yet the differences are minute. That is the most remarkable observation from Courage, which has not been emphasized. Oh, I would disagree there about the most remarkable observation from Courage that's been lost in the discussion is uh, very strong. It was underpowered to look at mortality benefits in the nuclear substudy, but the very strong suggestion that revascularizing patients with a large ischemic burden did have a mortality benefit. And I don't know why we don't talk about that more. You said just the opposite. So I was confused about that because yeah. I, I, took, I took that as a very important take-home message that, you, that PCI did impact ischemia um, in, the, in the nuclear study and that if you did impact ischemia, you did impact death in MI. And I think you yeah. differed with that. No, in your let, me, let me clarify. 